All right, good morning, everyone. Welcome to the Dolphin Island Sea Lab, our Facebook Live series. Uh, today, we are talking about our invasive species problem. And my name is Greg Graber. I'm one of the full-time uh, educators here at the Dolphin Island Sea Lab. And being that we are out here a lot, we are able to kind of get a look at how things have changed over time. And one of the things that we have definitely noticed over time is the invasion of a couple of species of plants that have taken over our coastal habitat. All right. And not just our coastal habitat, but moving up into Alabama and trying desperately to keep it from moving up into Alabama. And so being out at the marsh, right here next to the road that we pull up with with students, like you maybe have seen some of our Marsh Mania videos, it's the same habitat, but with the encroaching issue of invasive species. And so what we're talking about with that invasive species idea, if you're not familiar with it, is that invasive species are non-native species to an area that have been brought in by humans and then they have taken over, whether it's lack of predation or whether it's lack of anyone paying attention to it and then it goes crazy. Maybe you're familiar with kudzu depending on where, where you are viewing from or maybe you're very familiar with the fire ant bed that's back there. One of Alabama's greatest gifts to America is uh, the fire ant, which was first documented out here. But what we're focusing in on today are three species of invasives, all right? Plants starting off, we'll finish up with an animal, and then we'll do at least another video on invasives talking about the actual marine environment where we're seeing a large influx of invasives like lionfish out in the open water that have taken over the Atlantic, the Caribbean, and the Gulf of Mexico, especially in reef systems, and Alabama has the largest artificial reef system. So that'll be coming later on, but today we're focusing in on some of the other invasives that get less press, but if you know a forester and your family is in forestry, then you are very familiar with it, and we don't have to go far because it is right here and we have two invasives growing right out of each other that are two of the worst invasives we have around and so we'll start with the pretty tree right here and if i damage it nobody cares because it is a serious serious problem this is what a lot of people have referred to in the past as our coastal kudzu easily identifiable by the spade like leaf it looks like a playing card and this is what is called a Chinese tallow tree, all right? Commonly around here, the common name is the gray popcorn tree or just the popcorn tree around here, but this is its leaf. It's very distinctive uh, leaf pattern for our area. And with that leaf pattern and this plant's ability to adapt, the other well-known fact about it around here, this far south, is this is our fall color. If you live in other places, you get the beautiful tree change. Well, this is our tree change and then our other fall color. That is simply called poison ivy around here. So two plants that look pretty when they're dying, but are, um, you know, not everybody's favorite plants. So these guys change to every color you can think of. You can see a little bit of that right here. Pretty colors, the oranges and the reds and the greens and the purples in this little tiny leaf uh, coming up and this plant was and is well known for in the past being a medicinal plant all right uh, it is native to asia and it's generally contributed even though there's some other evidence that benjamin franklin actually brought it over uh, in his many world travels but in general it was brought over ornamentally and industrially it is highly oily you can make candles with it you can use it as a uh, plant that not only can produce waxes and oils but it, it also can be used for medicinal purposes as well now when it dies and when it's decaying it actually produces a toxin that hurts other plants and allows it to grow up so it is easy to take over a habitat because very few things will mess with it all right and it 
gets rid of other plants trying to encroach on its habitat. And a really great example of this is this is a really young popcorn tree right here. But in other places on the island, we had a forest fire a few years ago, and we'll get to forest fires in just a little bit. But that tree right here, they were able to pull out a bunch of these invasives after the forest fire. And that tree is three to five years younger than our local slash pine trees. And it is taller than those local slash pine trees because it outcompetes them for space and light. Now, what it does is it's shallow rooted. So if it's shallow rooted into the ground, it doesn't take the time to spread itself out. And that allows for it to put more interest to the plant into growing up and out above ground. So the issue with that is, is that they get quite large. And then if you have a storm of some sort, they're also the first ones to fall down. Okay, so that can also be a problem as well if you have one in your yard, around the forest, that sort of thing, they are unstable. So with this plant being invasive, being able to take over, those seeds spread rapidly, hence the name the popcorn tree. And unfortunately, this is all brand new, but if we had done this back in the fall, you would see this little tree loaded. It only takes a couple of years for it to become mature to start producing seeds. and when they open up, it looks like a popped tuft of popcorn, hence the name the popcorn tree. So it is a serious, serious competitor to our local trees, longleafs slash magnolias, the typical trees that you would think of in the south. This is one of those problems that is taking over our uh, areas, all right? So if you move down in the picture, you get the other one, all right, the other plant. And it doesn't look like much. It actually looks just like the stuff in the back that Joanne and Chris talked about during their marsh mania. The tall grass sticking up is that black needle rush that Joanne was mentioning. The shorter green grass that definitely resembles what's next to it is our smooth cord grass. But those are native. Those are creating that nursery ground that we're focusing on with our Marsh Mania series. But in front of that is this stuff right here. And this is what is called Kogan grass or Kogan grass. And when it dies, it looks like this right here. And when it's alive, it looks like this. So you can see the dead grass versus the green grass. And this is actually when it becomes a problem, and this is how this was introduced in the US. Rumor has it that it was introduced shipping Satsuma oranges in crates across uh, oceans and in other ways, but as packing material. And if you think about what we do with our packing materials as well, you get something from Amazon, you get something from Walmart in the mail, you get something for Christmas, we don't take care of our packing peanuts. We don't make sure, you know, especially if you have kids, they love to destroy it. And so these guys get tossed in a ditch. They make their way down. They look bad. They look ratty. And the rest is history now. All right. And it is a huge problem. And one of the problems with it is that are many is that if you feel the leaf, which unfortunately you can't, but I'll try my best to kind of make you feel like it. If you know what a sawgrass plant is and I'll never forget being on my big wheel. I'm aging myself now. In the 80s, I fell into a sawgrass plant. Well, it's a sawgrass for a reason, <laughs> and it cut me up pretty good. Well, this has that same feeling, and it is salacious on the inside. I mean, it has little pieces of silica in it. I'll translate that loosely as it has little shards of glass-like structures in it. And with those glass-like structures in it, animals don't eat it. Stuff that you would think would love tall grass like this, like a horse, like a cow. You know you're not good if a goat won't eat you, all right? And so a goat and those guys will not feed on this grass. So there is one predator or two predators or three or four or five that won't take it out for us, okay? So there's a problem. Now, when it dies, similar to the popcorn tree, when it dies, and it rots and it decays, it leaves that silica trace in the sediment and the soil and the plants that are around it 
cannot deal with the silica. So again, it is effectively poisoning out that area, okay? So when it does that, it allows it to grow, and as you can see, it has taken over just right here on this roadbed, on this road line. And with that roadbed and road line happening here, this was opened up for the airstrip that's back behind us. And when it was opened up and the sun was here, this decided to take over, all right? Not shockingly. So, how do you know if you've got it around your house? Well, right now is a wonderful time because if you're driving on a highway by yourself, socially distancing, right? But you're going to the store, this plant is in bloom and the seed pods are out. And if you're riding and you look on the side of the road, you'll see a tuft that looks like a tall, skinny dandelion seed. Now, don't see any of these seeding right now, but all of them on the way to work today were seeding right now. And it looks like a tall, skinny dandelion kind of blowing in the wind. And that tall, skinny dandelion, every time a car passes it, blows those seeds, spreading this out, okay? So it creates a serious, serious issue because the seed dispersal is so easy. So why is it a problem? Well, it is a fire plant species. And for us, we have habitat that are fire dependent habitats, okay? And so when those fires occur, if this plant is around, it will open up, the forest has been burned, sunlight comes in, and these plants and their seeds will grow up quickly and spread. Now, the bigger problem is, is that because they're a fire dependent species, they ignite in extremely low temperatures and they burn incredibly hot. So if you have a lot of this in an area, in a forest, in a roadbed, you can actually jump fires across roads and spread like wildfire, all right, with this plant. It is a serious, serious problem. And so foresters and clear cuts and, um, and even developments, if you're building a new subdivision, those areas are extremely prone to Kogan grass takeovers, okay? And so much so that I have heard multiple times that around the state of Alabama, in clear cuts and other areas, that when you are mowing grass and you're cutting down trees for a development, that a lot of those trucks and heavy equipment must be rinsed thoroughly and washed thoroughly to hopefully rid any of those interstate mowers or heavy equipment to get rid of the seeds of the Kogan grass. So that gives you an idea of just how big of a problem it is. And so I know they have found it about halfway up the state in different pockets over the last uh, 10 years or so, but it is a serious problem uh, here in Alabama. All right. So and we have just a couple of questions. Great. Um, so Ellie wants to know how big the popcorn tree gets and does it stay alive year round? Uh, well, it does stay alive year round, but it loses all of its leaves. Now, how big can it get? 30, 40 feet tall. So it can get uh, quite large in areas around us especially. So this is just a juvenile. But again, their problem is, is that they mature, they start producing seeds at a young age. So even something as small as this can start dropping seeds and they can produce hundreds of thousands of seeds per tree. And then when they fall over during a storm, that just disperses them more quickly. Rihanna, who's six, asks, is there a creeper version of the popcorn tree too? A creeper version? Not that I know of. Like a vine version? Not that I know of. But we do have other invasive vines uh, that are a climbing vine that are invasive as well. And then Carl asks, are there any control methods for these two plants on Dolphin Island? Any control. So the Park and Beach Board, I know, after our forest fire, when it opened up the canopy, the, uh, the ground cover on the island, as we walked through the forest during our beach walks and that sort of thing, they were able to go in and pull dead popcorn trees, pull them out, pull them out, pull them out as best they could about five to seven years ago and, uh, and get rid of them as best they can. But because there's so many seeds that these produce, you can only do so much about them. 
And so now, as I mentioned, the forest fire was years ago and they were pulled out. These guys had a jump start that allowed them to grow up, but the pine trees were already growing. The juvenile pines were already growing and these guys are already out competing them for height and space in the bird sanctuary here on Dolphin Island. So remediation is very difficult. For this, it's a chemical process. You can burn it. You can chemically burn it. So using um, herbicides, it's extremely expensive. So to give you an idea of the money involved in invasive species in 2017, just the U.S., and we're not the only country that has invasives, just the U.S., spent about three billion dollars on invasive mitigation which is pretty impressive when you think about invasive plants because you look at a plant and you don't think that it could be that big of a deal but it is charlotte who's eight asks is there anything good about these plants well like i said both of them were industrial plants so like kudzu kudzu was brought in totally without the thinking that it was going to be a problem to help stabilize overpasses and interstate systems. Well, nobody paid attention to it. And then it became kudzu, and as we know it. So these guys, again, medicinal uses, industrial uses, the oils are used um, in these plants uh, around the country, again, originating in Asia and then being brought over. So here they're not very useful, but in other places they are. And they have been used in the U.S. in the past for industrial use as well. All right, so um, when, when you're looking out at the, did, Angela, did you see that? What? You didn't see that thing running behind the? No, I missed it. Go Hold on a second. <laughs> oh, thank goodness I caught it. Oh. What is that? Oh my goodness. Hold on one second. We'll get the mic back on because I didn't want to want this guy to get away. Oh, thank goodness. Oh, here it is. Yeah. All right. Our educators are in shape. Oh, no, I'm not. I'm out of breath now. I hope I can finish this. All right, guys. No, this guy's not alive at all. But it does live in the marsh and it is highly. Oh, but I think we have an invasion. Uh oh. We have another one. We have another one right here. How do we get more on one of these guys? Oh because they're horrible. They could produce their young and be pregnant by the afternoon. This is one of the worst animal invaders we have. And if you're tuning in from Louisiana, you definitely know what this animal is. This is not a beaver, no paddle-like tail. My hand's covering up the tail. This guy spun around, no paddle-like tail. It's not a muskrat. It's not a rodent of unusual size from a, the Princess Bride. This is a nutria. All right. And so these nutria are highly invasive from the South American continent, <laughs> South America. So generally from Brazil, this is one that definitely inhabits our marshes. And again, as I mentioned, if you're from Louisiana, they are a serious serious issue and they just upped the bounty in louisiana for the 2019 2020 season to six dollars per tail if you kill one and you bring it in so that gives you an idea of just how invasive these plants uh these animals are they are a huge problem this one went to the day spa before it was uh taken out this is the typical color because people always ask why is yours so blonde well this dark brown color tells you that it's a nutria and they inhabit wetlands, okay? And so obviously this salt marsh we are in is one of the many kinds of wetlands we have across Alabama. And starting due to the fur trade being brought in to Southern Louisiana, Avery Island, okay? And so when they were brought in for that fur trade after we had killed a lot of things like otters and foxes and things for pelts these guys were used for a fur trade so hats and jackets and coats and stuff there's even a seinfeld episode based around this 
which is pretty funny with a Nutria hat. So the fur is very soft. When we take these out for outreach, people are amazed by how soft they are despite their, uh, their large rat-like look. And they are in the top three to five largest rodents in the world. So imagine a rat that weighs about 20 pounds full grown. And that is your Nutria. So that is behind a capybara and a beaver. And that's really it in that group that is the Nutria. One of the telltale signs is if you zoom in right down here is their bright orange Cheeto colored teeth. All right, so those bright orange teeth tell you that it is a Nutria. And that Nutria and those teeth allow this guy to be a serious herbivore. They're also incredibly good swimmers. You can see the paddle-like feet like a duck, the webbed feet here that allow them to swim. And you can find their tracks here in the marsh when we bring students out because what you'll notice are three or are four footprints, but they always drag their tail. So there's a line between all of their legs and their footprints that tell you that the new tree has been out. And then even more fun, it looks like little tiny sea cucumbers, you can find their scat. So you know that they're out, you can find their poop out on the ground here in the marsh. But back to being invasive, what do they do? They're herbivores. So they feed on our marsh grasses. So in Louisiana, that already is having issues with loss of habitat and coastal wetlands and marshes, this has become a major issue. You know it's a major issue if you still have a bounty on it and they reintroduced it a while and then they raised the bounty. So that means that if you kill one, you get money for it. That's what I was mentioning before at $6 a tail now. So with this, as cute as they kind of are, they are a serious problem. They also are burrowing into levees around Louisiana, but it's not just Louisiana. Mobile, Alabama and our native area used to have Nutria rodeos. For weekends like we have fishing tournaments they had nutria rodeos and those nutria rodeos are exactly what it sounds like it was basically how many can you bag in a weekend and so we do that now with lionfish invasions and spear fishing these rodeos to eradicate these invasives and so this is one of those invasives so being that they eat these plants they'll actually pull the plant up and eat them and eat the roots i'll out of them. That way they have effectively separated what we call rhizomes, the running roots underneath the ground that the Kogan grass will grow from, that the marsh plants will grow from, and when you separate them and you eat that part, that's no longer connected, so you have effectively separated that plant out. All right, And then when they burrow, they are uh, digging into places that we don't want to be dug such as those areas along riverbeds in the levees in New Orleans and southern parishes of Louisiana. So they are a serious, serious issue uh, for us. We do have them on Dolphin Island. We periodically see them around and they used to be more impressive around. So if you're talking about predators of something that weighs 20 pounds and is a big rat, in their native habitats, they have several. It's South America, right? Around the Amazon, around the Amazon, they have large snakes, they have jaguars, they have crocodiles, they have uh, large snakes, and around here we have our American alligator. So, being that we only have one large predator that can feed on something this big, you can understand why they have taken over. Now, when I say they've taken over, you can now find this plant, uh, this animal, from Louisiana. From Louisiana, oh, he's biting my microphone cable. Um, you can find this guy from Texas all the way up the East Coast now. It is a major issue. So, and that's less than a hundred years old of invasion. These guys have now crossed from the Gulf all the way up to Maryland and the Chesapeake area, maybe even farther north. I just don't know exactly their total range now. But they are a major issue around our area as an invader goes. So these are a few of the ones that are encroaching on impressively important habitat like our marshes, all right, and our maritime forest. The Kogan grass, the popcorn tree, and the Nutria, they all are invasive species, again brought in from other places and then taken over in those places, all right? So a lot 
couple of last minute questions. Great. Um, Jacob asked if it was a giant guinea pig. It looks like a guinea pig. It's a cousin. It definitely has the face. But no, it's a nutria again. A lot of people know it as a swamp rat. That's what a lot of people know it as. Um, and it looks like, oh, somebody had, how did they invade here? But I think you talked about that. Correct. How they came here. Yep. Um, and then the last question from Ava, who's 12. Aren't snakeheads invasive species? Can they actually walk on land? Uh, they, they can move from pond to pond. Yes, they can, like a lungfish, uh, to some degree. I mean, you're not going to see them walking through the woods just hanging out. But yes, they, they, they can move across land. So yes, a snakehead is a type of invasive. We have numerous types of invasive. We actually have another one. We have a climbing vine right here that's another invasive. Um, but the idea of snakeheads and others like zebra mussels and stuff, those guys are for a different time, all right? So we're gonna continue a little bit about of invasives in another episode of one of our C-Lab things. So tune in, all right? And we have more coming up tomorrow. And then next week with Earth Day, we have a double Facebook Live as well for uh, the C-Lab for Earth Day. We're talking about in the afternoon, talking about checking out how we scientifically dive and how we use diving. And in the morning, we're talking sharks of the Gulf of Mexico uh, next week for Earth Day. So come back and celebrate with us over the next couple of days and the next week as we'll be continuing our daily input of marine science for those people at home.